Meantime, the NAR also found itself at odds with the group over the simmering issue of the Mukarapu land. This new government, like the previous administration, was questioning the Jamaat's claim of ownership. To the Jamaat, it was not just a continuation of the old problem, but worse. We came onto this land with an agreement, a documented agreement, which I have given to you, and all the people who are the movers and shakers in this community know that the government gave us 8.8 acres of land and a cornerstone was laid that is still there till today. You know, it seems clear the land was somebody else's. How did another group get control of it? The Jamaat had also started targeting key government officials within the NAR, claiming to have evidence linking them with the drug trade. The matter went to court and a seesaw situation ensued, with rulings first for, then against the Jamaat. A ministerial team, under then Agriculture Minister Dr. Brinsley Samaru, was mandated to look into the matter, but little progress was made. In addition to this, there was controversy over shipment of medicines which the Jamaat had brought into the country. With the situation already one of open confrontation and getting worse, the decision was taken to move on the group. We were there to prevent the Jamaat from continuing to build on the non-disputed land. Where did the instructions come from? From the Minister of National Security. At the time, seven, I think it was Minister Richardson, through the Chief of Defense Staff, the current Minister Brigadier Teda, to myself, Head of the Army. So in April of 1990, the dead of night was shattered by the armed forces moving in next door. Paratroopers, you know, um, shuffling down ropes, and it was a whole military operation to provoke a particular reaction. Inside the Jamaat, the appearance of what it considered the wolf at its gates triggered a siege mentality. During the approximately three months the army was on the land, there were frequent run-ins with the Jamaat. It disrupted our whole working, they disrupted the school, everything, and there's a constant conflict with our women, and we do not play with our women. Again, false accusations. You know, the, the Jamaat would attempt to discredit anybody to try to justify their own illegal and criminal actions. So once again, the Jamaat went to court, their challenge spearheaded by attorney Ramesh Lawrence Miraj, the current Attorney General, who was mandated to convince the court that the army's occupation of the land was unlawful. Once again, however, the courts failed to deal effectively with the matter. Criminologist Ramesh Devsaran feels it's a point that contributed to the matter getting out of hand. The judicial system almost collapsed under the weight of these hearings, which kept going on from one to another. The judges themselves became confused. There were judges who would give one judgment today and the next week another judgment from a different judge would come. Justice Richard Crane, who heard the matter, questioned the validity of the decision to occupy the land and called on the security forces to give reasons. The soldiers were ordered off the land. The Jamaat celebrated what they saw as sure victory. However, Justice Crane was later to disqualify himself from the case and things started to fall apart the army continued its occupation. And they refused to hear the court. So we had no choice. Here it is that they, they, they refused to obey the, order, the court order to move from the land because they had no right to come on the land. Although they claimed this is what forced them into action, in fact, the seeds of insurrection were germinating long before. Since the beginning of 1990, certain Jamaat members were being trained in Middle Eastern countries. Uh, some people went to Egypt, okay, uh, some people went to Libya, some people went to Sudan, okay, um, basically it was an Islamic course. In addition, the Jamaat had organized a gun club in the United States through a U.S. citizen, Louis Hanif. Hanif had been buying arms and hoarding them in a Miami warehouse. Everything from M1 and M14 assault rifles to Uzis, AK-47s, handguns, and a number of state-of-the-art seven-shooter pump-action shotguns were bought. They were purchased with money that the, the, the U.S. authorities at the time knew they were purchased. Um, they were stored in a warehouse in, in Miami. The U.S. authorities were duped into believing that the weapons were removed from one warehouse to another. And so they, they relinquished their surveillance on the very first warehouse. And the weapons were then 
ex exported to Trinidad um, as building material for use in the building of a school in the mosque. It was information which local security personnel claim was never shared with them, which contributed as well to the guns entering the country without anyone being suspicious. Another question arises, how did the guns get past customs? Ten pieces of plywood were laid out, and then twenty pieces placed on the stand and hollowed out. The guns were fitted into the opening. Then twenty more pieces were laid atop this, and a bundle of ply bound. No one suspected what lay at the heart of it. Two such bundles were shipped into the country. They came through the port at Point Lisas. The Jamaat also had an inside source at the Customs and Excise Department, the relative of a man who'd been involved in another insurrection some 20 years earlier. Now this man worked at the port in Port of Spain, but it is suspected that he may have had some influence in ensuring that the shipment with the weapons was cleared at Point Lisas. They were then loaded onto a truck bound for Trin City. Meantime, the situation was reaching boiling point back at Mukarapo Road. The run-ins with the law became more frequent. Things got worse when a member of the group was shot in the arm during an altercation with police. By this time, several Jamaat structures had been torn down, including a bakery in Laventil and an agricultural project in Cora. To add fuel to the fire, a popular Calypso tent just across the road from the Jamaat compound, the Mecca, owned by a group including Clive Nunes, also fell to the bulldozers. The Muslim mean, as you know, that the Mecca is an important aspect of their religion. And they went on a slogan that they smashed down the Mecca and they were now coming for the Medina, which is the, the mosque and so on. The event started coming together. Tensions were rising, trouble was brewing. The Jamaat felt that the courts had failed it. It felt it had become a strong enough force on the streets. Its membership in Sopo gave it a link to the population at large. It had trained personnel and guns, and its intelligence was reporting disturbing news. And we had a double agent that was working in the ministry with Selwyn Richardson. So the agent uh, informed us that, that uh, Selwyn Richardson had decided that they, they were going to, to destroy. The, well, of course they did, eh, eventually, that they were coming next. After they destroyed the other things, they were coming next to destroy the headquarters. And we said, uh, we, we began to make preparations. For Yasin Abu Bakr, it was now just a matter of giving the go-ahead. The guns were in the country, and a few weeks before the attack, the Jamaat had started manufacturing bombs and explosives on the Mukarapo compound itself, under the very noses of the armed forces. Well, how, I mean, you, anybody can build anything anywhere. I can build a bomb right here in front of you, you won't even know what I'm doing. Doing it, doing it in a compound, in a building where we don't have access, that's... I mean, anybody can do that. That's, that's a claim. It's a hollow claim. I mean, you can build a bomb anywhere. They had the experience of their foreign trained soldiers to fall back on, and now local youths were also being trained. But even though everyone knew something was at hand, the details were kept very tight. Only the hierarchy knew exactly what was being planned. Ironically, all of this was taking place without the security forces catching on. Indeed, then head of the army, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Brown, admits that there was no intelligence unit in the army. He says the police special branch may have known what was happening, but did not share that information. A lack of appreciation by, the, by all the security forces, you know, um, that, that this was a real threat, um, and that, that you should really be, be looking at these people more closely. Former NAR Minister Lincoln Myers confirmed that there was suspicion of what was being planned, but guess what? It was ignored. From Williams on, from Williams up to today, I think we have mishandled that situation. The Jamaat began its own surveillance of the Red House and of TTT. The plans were in motion, and overseeing the details was a man called Bilal Abdullah. Abu Bakr himself visited Parliament on two occasions to get a lay of the land. Training was taking place full speed ahead at Mukarapo, but still, those who were to be involved did not have any specific information. Lieutenants were identified and told to get teams together. They were told only to be prepared to move when the word was given, and it was given twice before July 27. The first time, there was too much rain. The second time was earlier that week. 
In fact, Jamaat personnel were already positioned throughout Port of Spain. And when the decision to stand down came, it was a hustle to get to them. Abu Bakr, however, says the two cancelled runs were intentional. Therefore, it was after Bakr got word that the army was planning to move on the mosque that he made his fateful decision. Ten years later, former NAR MP Jennifer Johnson, a hostage at Red House, says the imam was sadly mistaken. That was just, um, that's just an excuse because from my recollection, the army was, had been there for some time, you know. I don't remember the exact time, but the army had been there for some time. And certainly, um, the government never acted in, in, in that way. A key factor in the Jamaat's decision to take armed action lies in its interpretation of Islam. Well, I say oppression is worse than slaughter. It's better man kill you than to oppress you. Uh, there's a saying of the prophet that uh, when you see something wrong, you should stop it with your hands. And if you can't stop it with your hands, you should speak against it. And if you're not strong enough to speak against it, you should hate it in your heart. I think we went through all the stages. We hate it in our heart. We spoke about it. And the time came for us to stop it with, with our hands. But that interpretation has been questioned by other Islamic groups, including Astra itself. And you, it is well known throughout the, the Western world that the word jihad, meaning fighting in the way of God. Is, is, a, is means struggling in the way of God, and it doesn't necessarily mean taking up arms and, and demolishing everything that doesn't agree with your focus or your view of life. But that's now history. The go-ahead was received on Thursday the 26th of July, and the man who is now the group's head of security, Hassan Anyabule, made the trip up to Trin City, where the arms were stored. 